Thank you very much for your uh, kind words of introduction, everybody for being here. It's a joy to be with you. I think I was last at an Ocampo conference up in Boston, but it's probably eight to ten years ago. Um, so it really is great to be back with you all today, especially as we reflect on the question of resiliency in the pastoral professions. The question of resiliency in the pastoral professions is very much related, I think, to the topic of a really big and lively discussion going on it, the topic of moral injury um, as it pertains to PTSD, war veterans and so on. They're very much related. To how do you deal with the damage inflicted upon you uh, through the various professions you're uh, asked to undergo? There's a fascinating book called Killing from the Inside Out, Moral Injury and the Just War by Robert Meager. And he draws upon an incident in Sophocles' play, The Philoctetes, just to illustrate the untold damage done by war upon those who are called upon to fight other people's battles. Odysseus, a man with, as it says, shabby, slit-eyed soul, talks the young Neoptolemus into betraying the, his high moral ground to become an instrument of Odysseus's wiles. Later in the story, looking back, Neoptolemus realizes that although he survived, he is nevertheless wounded through a self-inflicted wound. And as Meager characterizes it, he says, the malaise he suffers is that of moral injury, which he self-diagnoses and describes in these timeless words. Quoting from, uh, from uh, Odysseus now. All is discussed when one leaves his own nature and does things which misfit it. So the misfitting deed in this case is that of killing another human being, which even, done, even when done within the context of war remains murder and leaves an indelible imprint, a moral injury upon the one who committed the act, even when done for a higher cause, and which is not only not wiped clean, but is exacerbated when it's defended in the name of a just war, as Robert Meager demonstrates so forcefully. So that's what he does with um, Sophocles' play Philoctetes. But there's another lesson to be learned from the Greek poets, another way in which a human being might be killed from within. And this again is taught to us by Odysseus. Although he, ever cunning, he avoids the danger of this particular death. It's exemplified for us in his decision not to remain with Calypso, to live the untroubled life of an immortal god, to live as a god with gods, and so transcend his human nature. He chooses not to stay with Calypso, but he prefers instead to return to Penelope, to live as a human within human society, with all the vulnerability, tribulations, and the certainty of death that this entails. So what could possibly justify that decision to leave Calypso and return to Penelope? What gives value, or what value is there in weakness, suffering, and ultimately death? What value is there in that, that he would choose that rather than to stay with Calypso? Now, Martha Nussbaum raises this question in a really interesting essay that she wrote called Transcending Humanity. She accepts that choosing the life of a god is indeed desirable and an intelligible choice because such life would not suffer from any of the constraints that make human lives transitory, limited, precarious and often miserable. Moreover, following alongside that negative motivation, there's also the positive attraction of transcendence itself. <laughs> So we've got in the philosophical tradition, going back at least as far as, as Xenophans, a position which held that the sole activity of a divine being was thinking. And so Plato and those who followed him maintained that the highest 
and the most proper activity for human beings is philosophical contemplation. And although he would say, although we might resemble the lower forms of life, and although it might seem that we live in subjection to nature and fate, there's part of us, Plato teaches, that is divine, immortal, intellectual, unitary, indissoluble, ever unchanging, as he puts it in the Phaedo. And it's this rational element that must govern the rest of our being, thereby securing us from all the the vicissitudes of fate and bodily life, all the troubles, all the trials, all the illnesses we will inevitably come into because we're embodied. Similarly, the later philosophical tradition based uh, of the Hellenistic period, with the possible exception of skepticism, they offered the philosophical schools of late antiquity were really kind of like the Christian church in that they offered a way of salvation. They offered various techniques based on the dominion of, domination of reason and the formation and shaping of the person. Their claim was to be the art of life and to assert that they can do more than any other source of logos in healing and governing the soul. And so in contrast to superstition and popular philosophy, where the outcome is always uncertain, true philosophy in that period claimed to remove the element of darkness and uncontrol from human life, making tihi, fate, subordinate to an intelligible and intelligent technique, craft, or art. And so it would offer its adherents the possibility of a godlike life. So there is all of this, and it always has been, this um, desire for transcendence and this um, claim to be able to offer us a logos which helps us escape from the vicissitudes of life. But Odysseus didn't stay with Calypso. He chose, rather, to return to his mortal bride. To have remained with Calypso would have brought Odysseus' story to an end. He would no longer have had the opportunity to demonstrate the virtues and achievements which are characteristically human. He would no longer have had the opportunity to fall in love. Because even when the gods, the Greek gods of mythology, even when the gods fall in love, they fall in love with humans, mortal humans. So the Greek poets, according to Martha Nussbaum, understood the fact that, as she's quoting her, part of the particular beauty of human excellence is its vulnerability. Despite all of our attempts to try and avoid it, this is what constitutes human excellence and human beauty, its vulnerability. Human beings are not gods, Neither the transcendently anthropomorphized Olympians, nor the purely intellectual divinity of the philosophical tradition. And accordingly, the good life for a human being is not the immortal life of the Olympians, nor one of contemplation. Contemplation is an acceptable activity when subordinated to specifically human ends. Rather, the goal of a human life is one that recognizes and accepts the full range of human values. And Martha Nussbaum, in following this out, finds such a position most fully elaborated with Aristotle. Aristotle philosophizing specifically within the confines of the appearances of things. He acknowledged that a central human value All the central human values such as courage, moderation, generosity, friendship, all the things that we value as humans can only be found in a life which is subject to risk, need, vulnerability and limitation. And so as Martha Nussbaum puts it, she she says, the nature and their goodness are constituted by the fragility of human life. 
Now, although her work is not concerned with Christian theology, the centrality of this insight is, in fact, central to Christianity. And it's a point which is recognised in passing by Martha Nussbaum. She makes this comment just towards the end of her article. She says, For Christianity seems to ground that in order to imagine a God who is truly superior, truly worthy of worship, truly and fully just, we must imagine a God who is human as well as divine. A God who has actually lived out the non-transcendent life and understands it in the only way that it could be understood, by suffering and death. So the life and death of Christ within this world not only endorses the value of the human situation, but it in fact refocuses and holds our attention on the world in which we live. But what is involved here is more than, in Nussbaum's words, a thought experiment, which concluded that a perfect being would perform intellectual contemplation. What is only imagined by Martha Nussbaum is a key conviction of Christian theology. The key conviction being that through a death, witnessing to Christ... Christians attain to the full status of being human, a son of God, in the crucified and risen son of God. So what I want to do, having explored the idea of um, moral injury and how it's being discussed in the contemporary philosophical field via Martha Nussbaum and Robert Meagher and others, is now to turn back to a specific figure in early Christianity to see how he explores all of that, the vulnerability of what it is to be human and the necessity for that vulnerability in order for us to be human. And the figure, of course, is one I've lived with for some 20 or 30 years, much to the annoyance of my wife. She thinks she's got to lay a a place for him at every dinner time because he's such a presence in our household. And that is St. Irenaeus of Lyon. Um, I would argue that no one, literally no one in the Christian tradition has thought through all of this more fully or more better than Irenaeus living at the end of the second century. He really can be called the first father of the Christian tradition. He was living in an age of martyrdom rather than the supposed peace of a Christian imperial epoch with all the compromises that that Christendom entails. Robert Meagher in his book on moral injury demonstrates that a state always operates with a view to its own interests even when it justifies those interests in theological terms. We're doing this as a just war for the good of the country, for the glory of God and so on. Irenaeus was a witness to the martyrs understanding their suffering and their death within the broad sweep of the economy of God, which he, for the first time in the history of Christian theology, unfolds from the beginning to the end, from creation to the eschaton, as a single movement, embracing both creation and salvation together. For him, it's not as it often is in modern popular theology, where creation is plan A, we mess it up, and God has to respond with the work of salvation in Christ, which effectively makes Christ plan B. It doesn't work like that. Okay, so he holds it together as a single economy, holding both creation and salvation together, to see in the death of the martyrs not a defeat or a victimization, but rather a witness to the creativity and the the salvific work of God, brought to perfection in this specific witness. But before we turn to Irenaeus, look at the first quotation on your sheet. I've all got the quotation sheets in front of you. From St. Ignatius of Antioch, um, writing at the beginning of the second century. He's on his, on his way to Rome to be martyred. There are more sheets available if others don't have them.
Oh, you've got to show it. Okay, so he, he, he's on his way to Antioch to be martyred, uh, from Antioch to Rome to be martyred, and along the way he, he sends letters to the various Christians he met, and then a letter to the Christians in Rome to prepare them for his coming. And basically what he says to the Christians in Rome is, whatever you do, don't interfere with my coming martyrdom. You know, don't try and bribe the judges to get me out of my martyrdom. Yeah? Don't try and hold me to this life. So he says, quotation number one, Birth pangs are upon me. Suffer me, my brethren. Suffer in the sense of allow. Suffer me, my brethren. Hinder me not from living. Do not wish me to die. Suffer me to receive the pure light. When I shall have arrived there, I shall become a human being. Suffer me to follow the example of the passion of my God. Okay. The terms are completely upside down to the way that we would tend to think. He's not yet born. Birth pangs are upon me. He's not yet living. Hinder me not from living. Do not wish me to die. Do not wish me to die by trying to get me out of my coming martyrdom. Yeah? So his martyrdom is his birth. He's not yet living. It's a birth into life. And he's not yet human. When I shall have arrived there, I shall become a human being. <coughs> So he's not yet born, he's not yet living, he's not yet human. All of this will be accomplished in his martyrdom. Only by willingly suffering death in confession of Christ, who himself willingly embraced the cross. So Christ showing us the free, self-sacrificial love that is the life of God himself, that is God, only by following this, is Ignatius able to be born into life as a human being. I've argued elsewhere, and I've given many talks on this, that I think that the background for this, the background for this vision, lies in the interplay between Genesis 1 and the Gospel of John. That's very clear from the opening words. Genesis and the Gospel of John open in the same phrase. In the beginning, in the beginning. John's playing off Genesis in, uh, in his Gospel. Genesis 1, chapter 1, it begins by God speaking everything into existence by a divine fiat in the imperative. Let it be, fiat. Let there be light, let there be plants, let there be all these different things. Let there be, it is, it's good, it's done. Then having done all of those works, um, spoken everything into existence by a divine fiat, God does something very different. In Genesis 1.26, he says, let us make a human being. Yeah? It's no longer in an imperative, it's a subjunctive. It's the only thing which is said to be God's own work. Everything else is simply, let it be, let it be, let it be, it's good, it's done, you know, next day, next day, next day. Having, brought, or having, having set the stage, having you know, set the background on the stage, God now begins his own particular work, the only thing for which he's said to take counsel and deliberate. This is what his work is. Let us do this. It's his project. Let us make a human being. It's a project. He doesn't say let there be a human being. Let us make a human being. It's a project. And I would argue it's not finished. It's not completed. It's not perfected until Christ is on the cross in the Gospel of John. When Christ says to Teleste, it's finished. It's brought to completion. It's perfected. And just before that, Pilate says, behold the human being. So you've got scripture opening with, let us make a human being, and it closes with, behold a human being, here it's finished, it's done, it's brought to completion. Okay. Let it be. Uh, he, 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 he says, um, let us make a human being. Everything else in creation, he says, let it be, it is, it's good, it's done. The only thing which is said to be his work, he uses a subjunctive, let us make a human being. And in fact, we're the ones who've got to give our let it be. Yeah, we're the ones who've got to use the imperative, let it be. Not my will, but thine be done. Christ, Mary, each and every one of us, Ignatius, so that, um, so that we can indeed be brought into the fullness of being human in the way that Ignatius talks about it. So having come into existence in this world through no choice of our own, 
There's a line in, in Dostoevsky's book, The Possessed, where Kirillov says, nobody asked me if I wanted to be born. We think we've got freedom, and we think freedom consists in being able to choose between tea and coffee, but nobody asked me whether I want to be born. I've got no choice about the matter. I've been thrown into an existence, an existence in which, whether we like it or not, we're going to die. I love being in parishes and young people's gatherings and talking like that and say, yeah, no choice about the matter. You're thrown to existence, and the existence which, whatever you do, you're going to die. It sucks. (laughs) (coughs) Basically, you're as good as dead already. (laughs) Yeah? Which is why life and death is completely turned around, that quotation from Ignatius. He's dead. We're all dead. The only way he's going to come to life is by following Christ, by being born, by taking up the cross, and so on. So we're thrown into an existence which, whether we like it or not, culminates in death. Yet Christ ascended across, manifesting the life of God, that he, we too often say in in, in our popular language, popular theology, that Christ has destroyed death. How often have you heard that said? Has he? How many people here are not going to die? Hmm, it's not so simple. The language, in fact, of the New Testament is that Christ has destroyed the power of death, which is the fear of death, which has held us captive. Yeah, it's not that he's destroyed death. He's turned it inside out to make it his own tool, destroying death by death. He's destroyed the fear of death, which has held us captive, subject to our passions, subject to lifelong bondage. So having ascended the cross to destroy the fear of death, we now have the possibility of freely choosing, just like Ignatius did, to be born into life. Not just to come into existence in a mortal existence, as we've all done. We've got the choice of following Christ, taking up the cross, uh, laying down our life in self-sacrificial love to be born into life. And then the very ground and existence of that life that we then begin to live is this free, voluntary, self-sacrificial love, which is nothing other than the very being of God himself. And in this way, we become human. Okay? So that's the sketch. That, that's what's behind Ignatius' statement in quotation number one on your sheet. It really challenges us to think otherwise um, than we tend to think about life and death. Um, let me see what time it is. Yeah, we've got time. I'm, I'm fully persuaded that our biggest challenge today is the fact that we do not see death. Yeah, and I'm sure it affects each and every one of you in the work that you do. We do not see death. death. And, but what I mean by that <coughs> is that until the middle of the 20th century, early part of the 20th century, everybody would have had at least one sibling die during their childhood. Everybody would have had a, one parent die before they reached adulthood. But the short child, obviously. Um, and they would have died at home. You would have been with them as they were dying for the weeks or the month that lay, lay up to it. You would have been with them with your friends and neighbours visiting daily or however often they could. You would have been with them, mopping their brows, literally being with them, and then as they die, gathered around them in prayer. You would have had their bodies at home for a few days thereafter, laying them out, washing them, saying prayers over them, with, again with friends and neighbours coming round to keep vigil with you, you would have then taken their body from your house to the church to commend them to God and then entrust them to the earth. That, that's the liturgy of death I'm talking about. And you would have seen that probably every month, every two months, between your family, your neighbours, your village, the place in which you live. You would have seen that all the time. Today, when somebody dies, in fact, today, there are really only two ways in which you can die, and that is either by accident or in hospital. If you die peacefully at home on your bed, 
the police have to come to investigate what happened. Yeah? You know, what, what happened? Has there been some kind of foul play going on here? Yeah? So either by accident or in hospital, and actually in hospital, you can't die, you've got to be killed. Yeah? You can be kept alive indefinitely, the machines have to be switched off. Okay? I'm not getting into the question of euthanasia. You know, life is finite, it does come to an end, and there's a point at which the doctor has to help that person die, no doubt about it, but today you know, it's a matter of switching off the machine at a due point. When the person dies, the family and the body are removed as quickly as possible. You're allowed a bit of time, but you don't want to become morbid after all, do you? (laughs) (laughs) Then the body is um, taken to the the funeral, the morticians to be made up to look beautiful, then placed in a funeral home under pink lights so that you walk away making a comment like, I've never seen them looking so good. (laughs) Although actually today people are more than of, uh, increasingly avoiding that step. I was talking to an undertaker where uh, he said that somebody had called him up and said, you know, my mother's died in such and such a hospital. Will you take the body, get the body, cremate it, and then tell me when you're done? Yeah, so no, 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 even no involvement at that point. Um, and then what we do today, today the general Western p- uh, practice, is we gather together without the body at a later time in order to celebrate their life. Yeah? Just think how anomalous it's become. We live all the time as if we live for the body. Yeah? Exercising, healthy, clothes, whatever. We, live, we spend a whole time living for the body. <coughs> and as soon as the person dies, we say, well, the body wasn't really them anyway. Let's celebrate their mortal soul. Now that they're playing golf with God 365 days a year. <laughs> celebrate their life without the body being there. So... Our whole relationship with death has completely changed over the last 50 years. Everybody from the beginning of the world onwards in whatever culture had to deal in an immediate way with death until the mid-20th century West. I would say that's the biggest change ever in human existence. Forget electricity, forget the web, forget whatever, whatever. That's the biggest change ever in in terms of human existence. And the significance of it is that if Christ has showed us what it is to be God in the way he dies as a human being, trampling down death by death, if he shows us what it is to be God in the way he dies as a human being, if we don't see death today, we've got no way of seeing God. Direct equation. Yeah? So our problem today is not secularism, postmodernism, consumerism, whatever, whatever, whatever. All of those come out of the fact that we don't see death. If you don't see death, you've got no horizon for knowing that your life is finite, no horizon for knowing transcendence. You come to think that, in fact, what we've got now is life. So when Christ says, I've come that you might have life and have an abundance, you say, oh, great, let me have some more of what I've already got. Let me live life to my fullest. You know, all the kind of sayings that we got in 20th century, 21st century America, live life to your fullest, explore the opportunities and do all those kind of things. Yeah? All of those are, in fact, a way of holding on to life, trying to preserve it in our own terms. Okay, that was a short excursus. Um, I'll try not to get involved in too many of them as I go through, otherwise we'll never finish. And those who've heard me talk now I can talk for six or 12 hours without stopping. (laughs) Okay, so uh, I've given you a sense of the the overarching scope of the economy. Let us make a human being, behold, it's finished. This is not plan B, rectifying a mistake we've made. This is a culmination. This is a perfection. This is what human existence is. A voluntary choice of self-sacrificial love. You can't make creatures already doing that. It wouldn't be voluntary self-sacrificial love. But you can make creatures who choose to do that. Yeah? And so when God says in Genesis 1.26, let us make a human being, that's not in fact what he does. What he does is makes males and females. Okay, now how male and female relates to being human, that's a whole other topic, and we could spend a whole half day on that, but, but that's, that's bound up together with it. Th- this is the way in which we come to be human. We don't start off as human, we end up as human. OK, 
asking. Now, the working out of this overarching scope of the economy of God within the framework of the lifespan of each and every one of us is explored really fully in three chapters, in a very intriguing way, in three chapters of Irenaeus' work against the heresies. Chapters, uh, book 4, chapter 37 to 39. 37, 38, 39. Usually when I talk in Irenaeus, I focus on other chapters, so it's nice to be able to do this one here. And he, he starts off these chapters by saying he's going to explore the ancient law of human liberty, that God created human beings having from the beginning power over themselves so that they can enter into this. Don't look at the quotations yet until I get to them, otherwise you'll be hearing one thing and looking at another. Now, fundamental to this whole project is that cre- only creatures created with freedom are capable of initiative and response. And only in this way are they capable of changing the mode or the fashion of their existence and growing into the immortality of God. Everything that comes into being passes away. Everything that comes to be dies. Okay? But if you create creatures with freedom who can voluntarily die in an act of self-sacrificial love, the life they begin to live that way cannot be touched by death because they've entered into it through death. Yeah? So by the very mortality now becomes a means of life for those who are able to freely take it up. So freedom is a prerequisite. Freedom and time. Time's hugely significant here. Freedom and time are prerequisites for a creature to change the fashion of their mode of existence and grow into the immortality of God. Aeneas incites many passages from Scripture to demonstrate the fact that we are free and then the corresponding responsibility and accountability that goes on with this. If we're created free, then we're called to account. Aeneas turns to those who would deny this, representing, he claims, the Lord as destitute of power, unable to accomplish what he wills. If God wanted to make human beings, why didn't he do it just then and there? Let there be a human being. Yeah? Why did he make creatures that have to grow into becoming human? And he draws out this um, problematic in the form of a question. So quotation number one, he says. Uh, but quotation number two, sorry, we're in two now. But they say, that they are his opponents, the Gnostics. But they say, he should not have created angels such that they were unable to transgress, nor human beings such that they immediately became ungrateful towards him. Because they were created rational, capable of examining and judging, and not like the irrational or inanimate creatures, which are not able to do anything of their own will, but are drawn by necessity and forced towards the good, with one inclination and one bearing, unable to deviate and without the power of judging, unable to be anything other than what they're created. He said, no, he should have created us to be what he wanted us to be and be done with it. Why go this whole circuitous way of getting there? Had this been the case, Irenaeus replies, it wouldn't have benefited either human beings or God. Had communion, life with God, um, would not have been precious. It would not have been desired. It would not have been sought after if we were created just like that. It would only be by nature and not the result of a proper endeavour, care or study. And as such, it would be misunderstood, he says. No pleasure would be found in it. We only take pleasure in that which we work after. (coughs) Aeneas then continues by quoting Christ's words about the violent take the kingdom by force. Paul's exhortation that we are to run the race, to emphasize the need for struggle on the grounds that Endeavour heightens the appreciation of the gift, as he puts it, as it lies with us to love God the more. The Lord has taught, and the apostle has handed down, that this will happen with struggle, for otherwise this, our good, would be unknown and not be the result of striving. 
Aaron Essen continues by giving an example of this. He says, as a faculty of seeing, sight, is desired more by those who know what it is like to be without sight, so health is desired prized more by those who know disease, light by contrast with darkness, life by contrast with death. So for Aeneas, the, the whole economy, from beginning to end, symbolized by the example of Jonah, look at his book, book 3, chapter 20, really, really interesting use of Jonah. The whole economy has been arranged in such a way to enable human beings to come to know their own weakness. The goal of the whole of the pedagogy of God is that we might know our weakness. Because only having known death will we thereafter hold on to life as a gift. And we you know I can tell you as much as I as I can't, I'm blue in the face that you've got life as a gift. But we all think, no, life is mine. Yeah? We know it intellectually we know it's a gift, but we still think, what am I going to do with what I've got? Oh, the only time we finally know it's a gift in our guts and not just in our head is when it's taken away from us. Yeah? So actually death becomes the supreme pedagogic moment yeah? for a God whose strength is made perfect in weakness, not in strength. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. When I'm dead is when God can be the creator because at that point I stop trying to work on myself. Okay. A little later, Irenaeus develops this analysis by contrasting two different kinds of knowledge. There's a knowledge, he says, on the one hand, which is gained through experience, just like I was talking about death being experienced in the guts. On the other hand, there's a kind of knowledge which is only gained through hearsay. I can tell you that, I know, Paris is the capital of France. We don't have to go there. It is, he points out, only through the experience of, uh, only through experience that the tongue comes to learn the, uh, the knowledge of bitterness and sweetness. You cannot tell somebody what sweetness is like. You've got to give them a spoon of honey. Yeah? There's some knowledge which can only be gained by experience. And likewise, he says, it is only through the experience of both good and evil, with the latter being disobedience, disobedience is what is evil, culminating in death. It's only through the knowledge of good and evil that our mind comes to receive the knowledge of the good, which is obedience to God, which is life for human beings. Only by experiencing both and then casting off disobedience by repentance, only then does a human being become tenacious in its obedience to God, growing into the fullness of life. The alternative to this, Irenaeus says, in a dram really dramatic quotation, which I, I'm afraid I didn't put on your sheet, it's just half a line, it says, if anyone shuns the knowledge of both of these... And the twofold perception of knowledge. So, if you try to avoid the knowledge of both realities and the two different ways in which we know things by hearsay and by experience, he says, forgetting himself, he kills the human being inside. He kills the human being inside. If we try and avoid both types of knowledge through both faculties of knowledge, we kill the human being inside. So there is no place in Irenaeus in his understanding of the economy of God for, as someone put it, an ethics of preventative abstention. The always mixed character of our life upon earth is intrinsic to the pedagogy by which we are brought through the whole economy to come to be a human being. So returning to uh, chapter 37, I'm basically going through these three chapters. They're short, they're worth reading. I'm just dissecting them for you and, and tracing the argument and commenting on it. 
So we're turning to uh, 437. Irenaeus continues by saying that the, therefore the heavenly kingdom will be more precious to those who've known the earthly kingdom. And if they prize it the more, they will also love it the more. And loving it the more, they'll be more glorified by God. And then he concludes his whole argument with quotation number three. Just read the first paragraph first. He says, God, therefore, has borne all these things for our sake in order that, having been instructed through all things, we may be scrupulous in all things. And that instructed through all things includes our experience of weakness, frailty, sickness, suffering, finally death. Okay. Uh, hence also we may be scrupulous in all things. And having been taught how to love God in accordance with reason, remain in his love. God exhibiting patience with regard to the apostasy of the human being, and the human being being taught by it, as a prophet says, your own apostasy shall heal you. Yeah, your own apostasy shall heal you. The whole of our apostasy, which results in death, is turned inside out by Christ's salvific economy, so that th that same economy and apostasy of death turns out to be what heals us and saves us. Because only when we finally die and are dead in the earth, only then do we finally admit that we are weak and that life comes from God and is his gift to us, and only then are we prepared to receive it rather than think it is mine to do with what I, as I like. Okay, we can talk more about that in questions and answers, but let's carry on through with Irenaeus. He then continues by placing this, this particular thing, uh, what, what he's just done, the first line there, with, um, within the whole economy. So he says, what, what we've got, in a, I spaced it by a line, but it's a direct continuation. Okay, he says, God thus determining all things beforehand for the perfection of the human being and towards the realization and manifestation of his economies that goodness may be displayed and righteousness accomplished and that the church may be conformed to the image of his son and that finally at the end, not at the beginning, at the end the human being may be brought to such maturity as to see and comprehend God so human Disobedience, human apostasy, sin, culminating in death, is for Irenaeus inscribed into the very unfolding of the economy. Death results from human action, but it's nevertheless a result which is subsumed and transformed within the larger arc of the economy as it brings a creature made from mud to share in the very life, glory, and power of the uncreated God. So demonstrating that goodness and righteousness of God worked out in and through the life of each individual human being, if they respond with faith and thankfulness, the conclusion, as we just saw in that quotation, is also corporate. For in this way, he says, uh, the church is conformed to the image of his Son. Yeah, it's not just an, it is an individual thing being worked out in each of our lives, but as it's being worked out in, the, in each of our lives, it is also the church that is being for, conformed to his son. Okay, so that's book 437. In 38, book 438, he analyzes the question with which he began, but from a slightly different point. In 438, he says, perhaps God could have created the human being perfect or as God from the beginning. Because, of course, all things are possible to God. However, he points out, created things, simply by virtue of being created, are infantile compared to the one who created them. They've just come into existence. They're newly existent. So Arrhenius describes Adam and Eve as children in paradise. Okay, they're infantile. And as they're infantile, they are not yet capable of the perfection to which they're called. They are initially infantile. They are 
unaccustomed, he said, to exercise in perfect virtue. We've got to acquire the virtues. So using another example, he points out that, yes, of course it would be possible for a mother to give her newborn child lumps of well-cooked meat, but it's not going to benefit the child anything. The mother's got to start with milk and then through gradual you know, uh, development of their nutritional systems and their teeth, for that matter, they can come to um, enjoy meat. So he says, so also it was possible for God himself to have made the human being perfect from the first, because of course God can do anything, but the human being would not be able to receive it, being as yet an infant. Yeah. Now this needn't be taken as suggesting that somehow the omnipotence of God is subject to the limitations of the matter he's working on. Just think about it. A newborn child this is also often raised up with the question of, are we not yet human? You know, surely we're human, not just when we die are we human, but surely. But just think about it, a newborn infant okay, may well have perfect limbs, but is completely unable to walk. There's nothing wrong with the limbs, but they've got to be exercised. Yeah? And part of the exercise by which the infant learns how to walk is falling down and getting bruised. He's got a very, very organic understanding of how God's pedagogy works in all this way. So also, when we come into this world, we do not immediately manifest virtue. I've never yet met an infant, the newborn infant, who says, comes out of the womb saying, Mother, you've had a hard time. You take a rest. I'll look after myself. <laughs> no. Newborn infants tend to come into the world saying... Wah, pay attention to me. Yeah, give me food, comfort, nourishment, whatever else it might be. Yeah? Our first breath onwards, what we do with our first breath onwards, individually and from the beginning of time, is we try and preserve our breath. Yeah? We, we draw it in, we say, hold on to it, and we say, pay attention to me, give me the food and nourishment that I want. Yeah? We do not come into the world with already exhibiting voluntary self-sacrificial love. No, we come to the world with a stony heart and holding on to our breath. We've got to exercise in virtue, just like we have to physically exercise before we can work. We've got to exercise in virtue before we are able to lay down our life for our neighbour. Yeah? So it's, it's perfectly natural that, that you know, there's progression in all of this. We'll see Aranias talk about that in just one minute. Okay. Um, so by definition, the created being cannot be uncreated. So how can God create beings that will share in his life? You can't create created beings with an uncreated life, by definition. But if you show the uncreated life of God to be voluntary, self-sacrificial love, then created beings can come to enter into that through the acquisition of virtue. Yeah? But that takes time. Okay. Um, it takes time, and in fact there's no end to the process. We never cease becoming uncreated. So look at quotation number four. This is the way he puts it out. He's got a really beautiful style of writing. He says, by this order and such rhythms, he's got a very musical tonality to his writing and to his thought. By this order and by such rhythms uh, and, by, and such a movement, the created and fashioned human becomes in the image and likeness of the uncreated God. At the end, not at the beginning. The father planning everything well and commanding, the son executing and performing, the spirit nourishing and increasing, and the human being making progress day by day in ascending towards perfection, that is, approaching the uncreated one. For the uncreated is perfect, and this is God. Now it was necessary for the human being to be created, and having been created, to increase, and having increased, to become an adult, 
and having become an adult, to multiply. What he's just done there in those couple of verses is really interesting for how we read Genesis. <clears throat> we tend to read, God, God blesses the human beings, Adam and Eve, and says, increase and multiply. Yeah? Now, we tend to think increase and multiply are synonyms. You know, multiply the human race, increase, and so on. But Irenaeus reads it as grow up and then multiply. Yeah? It actually in- increases in growing stature, and when you're ready, multiply. So, necessary for us to first be created, and then to increase. And when incre- having increased, we become an adult. And when we're adults, we multiply and have children. And after multiplying and having children, we become strong. And having been strengthened, to be glorified, which is death. And having been glorified, to see as master. For God is he who is yet to be seen, and the vision of God produces incorruptibility, and incorruptibility renders, us, renders one close to God. So such is the rhythm and the movement of human life, which recapitulates the movement of the whole economy. What you see is going on in the whole economy from Adam to Christ is effectively what happens in the, whole, the lifespan of a human being, yeah? from infancy to completion. We cannot escape its pattern or anticipate its conclusion any more than we can expect a newborn infant to live in an adult manner. So he continues, uh, not on your sheet, we'll come to the other ones in a minute. So he continues, irrational therefore in every way are those who await not the time of increase and ascribe to God the infirmity of their nature, you know, wanting to be adult before we're adult. You know, you, you can't do it both within the span of a human lifespan and within the span of the economy as a whole. Those who are irritated because God, because God hasn't made us perfect to begin with, but has made us having to grow through all of this vulnerability and suffering culminating in death, they are projecting onto God their ungratefulness. Um, and he continues. Uh, they, ne- they neither know God nor themselves. Being insatiable and ungrateful, they are unwilling to be, he says, they are, they are unwilling to be at the outset what they've been created. Human beings subject to passion. They want to be gods from the beginning rather than first learning to become human and then through our death becoming deified. And because they're not willing to escape the pattern of all of this, the timing, the movement, the rhythm of all of this, they blame God and show their ungratefulness for what he's given them. Even though, Irenaeus says, God has adopted this course out of pure benevolence. Irenaeus continues by citing two um, psalm verses two contrasting verses of Psalm 81 to demonstrate the point. Psalm 81 says, I say you are gods, sons of the Most High. But he says, since we could not sustain the power of this, the psalmist adds, but you shall die like human beings. I say you are gods, sons of the Most High, but you will die like human beings. And it says, this shows forth both truths. By his kindness, he graciously gave good and made the human being self-governing like himself. But by his foreknowledge, he knew the weakness of human beings and what would come of it. Yet by love and power, he conquered the substance of our created nature, leading us to him. Okay? So he turns death inside out. He knew giving us this power of, I say you are God, Son of the Most High, knowing we cannot bear it to begin with, but you will die like human beings, so that through dying like human beings, you in fact become God's sons of the Most High. So Arminius then concludes with one really intriguing passage, creation number five. This is how he concludes book four, chapter 38. He says, it was necessary, first, for, for nature to be manifest, after which, for what was mortal to be conquered and swallowed up by mortality, the corruptible by incorruptibility, and for, human, for the human being to be made in the image and likeness of God, 
having received the knowledge of good and evil. Having received the knowledge of good and evil. Now that's a direct quotation from Genesis uh, 3, 3.22, which is God's response after Adam and Eve ate the apple. Yeah. We, know, we all know the, the story about her, the serpent tempting Eve to eat the apple, looks good to the sight, Eve passes it on to Adam and so on. Uh, the serpent was saying that you know, God told you not to eat it because he didn't want you to share in the knowledge and so on like that. And then God comes along after they've ate it and says, so you've become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Yeah? Now, too often we read that as um, almost ironic words by God. So you think you've become like one of us by knowing good and evil? Yeah? As a serpent tempted you, you know, knowledge of good and evil, you become like God. Um, Irenaeus takes it in a straightforward way. This is what God says. You've become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Yeah? Knowing death. The evil here specifically, the apostasy, which le- sin, which leads to death and so on. But it's through death that we actually come to share in him. Okay. So he takes the words of Genesis 3.22. 3, Behold, the human being has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, as spoken without any sense of irony, but as a statement reflecting just how it is that the creature made from dust, by coming to know good and evil, and rejecting the latter through repentance, becomes a true human being in the image and likeness of God through their death. So to become human in this stature, to become a God, cannot be done by setting our own agenda, wishing to be like God. We think we know what gods are like, we wish to be like him, and nothing's going to get in my way. Such an attempt demonstrates an ignorance of everything that we've seen. On the one hand, that the fact that God has revealed in himself, in Christ, as the perfect living human being by dying for others. That's how God's revealed himself. And on the other hand, the comprehensiveness of the arc of the economy through which the creator brings his handiwork, the creation, to this stature of himself by undergoing the long pedagogy of the economy culminating in their death and resurrection so to become a living human being a god upon earth created males and females must allow themselves to be fashioned by god by being open and responsive to his creative activity And so Irenaeus concludes the whole of these three chapters with what I think is actually the most beautiful passage in his work. He's picking up on various themes that he's developed earlier in the book three and book four. Um, the the the, The artistic work of the word of God, the presence of the spirit as water enabling this formation, the water which is, makes earth malleable, and the response of the human being. He brings all of this together in quotation number six. He says, How then will you be a God when you are not yet made human? How perfect when only recently begun? How immortal when in mortal nature you did not obey the Creator? It's necessary for you first to hold the rank of human and then to participate in the glory of God. For you do not create God. God creates you. That's the most fundamental distinction. You do not create God. God creates you. If then you are the work of God, await the hand of God who does everything at the appropriate time. Again, this emphasis on the appropriate time. The appropriate time for you who are being made. Offer to him your heart, soft and pliable, and retain the shape with which the fashioner shaped you, having in yourself his water, lest you turn dry and lose the imprint of his fingers. By guarding this confirmation, you will ascend to perfection. 
the mud in you. For Aeneas, we are essentially and profoundly mud. Yeah, mud being shaped by the hands of God. So the mud in you will be concealed by the art of God. His hand created your substance. It will gild you inside and out with pure gold and silver and so adorn you that the king himself will desire your beauty. But if becoming hardened, you reject his art and being ungrateful towards him because he made you a human being, ungrateful it is towards God, you have lost at once both his art and his life. For to create is a characteristic of the goodness of God To be created is a characteristic of the nature of the human. If therefore you offer to him what is yours, that is, faith in him and subjection, you will receive his art and become a perfect work of God. If you do not believe him and flee from his hands, the cause of imperfection will be in you who did not obey, not in him who called you. For he sent messengers to, the pe- to call the people to the feast, but those who did not obey deprived themselves of his royal banquet. So, for the handiwork of God to be fashioned to the stature of Christ, the truly living human being, we must not harden ourselves trying to achieve our own projections of what we think it is to be God or what we want to be like and so on. Rather, we, want, we must be pliable, open, malleable. The goal has become malleable clay in God's hands, responsive in, in his hands, so that we can actually be his creature. Uh, Dr. Ross yesterday cited, as words of Irenaeus, um, relax in the hands of God. Yeah? Actually, the, the quotation is from Dennis Minns. He says, what the earth creature needs to learn to do above all is to relax in the hands of God and let God be the creator. So within that perspective, I'd suggest that the best definition, the Christian tradition of the human being is given by uh, uh, the letter of Barnabas, written sometime in the second century. The last quotation in your sheet. The human being is earth that suffers. It's by far the best definition the human being is earth that suffers Anthropos ye estin pascusa now Barnabas surely has in mind the image from the second chapter of Genesis God takes the clay from earth and he moulds it you know he rolls out the arms he twists out the fingers he sticks a nose on it and whatever else he might do with the clay yeah so the clay is suffering in his hands as it's being moulded and twisted and turned in all those ways but it would be extremely short sighted not to see in these words our own reality our own reality is clay which is suffering during the course of life upon this world battered bruised wounded all the different things the span of our life upon this world just as the economy of God as a whole from creation to salvation is understood by Irenaeus as being a pedagogy in which we learn to become human to become malleable clay in the hands of God to learn that in fact to lay down our life in love is better than to kick and scream protesting at our mortality you'll die anyway better get used to it whether we in fact do so however depends upon us it depends upon our reaction to suffering whether we offer our, offer our hearts with thankfulness to God who has shown his love to us in the cross of Christ and invites us to share in that love in and through our own suffering so that we become the vessel of his working or whether we choose to harden ourselves and reject the work of his hands so becoming brittle and useless clay. So the beauty of human beings, as we saw in the case of Martha Nussbaum's analysis of Odysseus, lies precisely in their fragility and vulnerability. 
to seek to transcend this basic fabric of human life, either by defining the only appropriate activity of human existence as being rational contemplation, or, as is much more likely today, to adopt some kind of ethic of preventative abstention to try and put children in cotton wool so they never experience anything evil or sad and never have to look upon death as that which reveals God. To do that kind of thing for Irenaeus would be to literally kill the human being in each of us. Not by a moral injury inflicted by others, but rather by our own choice in reaction to and a reaction that is, in more sense than one, all too human. Thank you.